Okay, I want to bring us back to where we started to focus in on a question that will guide us in our study of Galatians and Philemon, especially Galatians. Uh, we focused in on the evangelical approaches in the middle and noted <clears throat> that the significant difference between egalitarians and complementarians is this question of equality and status. That is also the significant difference between complementarians and the vast majority of persons throughout church history who held to various forms of a male leadership position. So a relatively new approach, but one that defines us as complementarians, egalitarians, in relationship to each other. So for the egalitarians, <clears throat> equal in status and function, in other words, egalitarian without a qualifier connected to it. For complementarians, equal in status but not in function, qualifier attached. And it is that issue of function that we want to look at today in Galatians and ask the question, does Paul address that? Uh, does he give us some reason to believe that function is excluded from oneness in Christ or included in oneness in Christ? Now, I want to recommend a, a, an article. It's not part of your reading in uh, DBE, but uh, an excellent chapter, double-wide chapter, by my co-editor, Rebecca Merle Groteis, in which she addresses this specific issue as it divides, divides egalitarians and complementarians. So equal in being, but not in status. And the question that, that arises with this, and I want to use this to kind of lay the backdrop for our study, the question that arises here is, if we are equal in being, but not in status, and the inequality in status comes from our being, then how does that work out logically? So we're equal in being, but because of our being, we're not equal in status. Do you feel a little bit of the tension in that kind of a twofold statement? And I think that's a major challenge. Uh, Becca Groteis addresses that in the chapter, and I'd like for us to address that in Galatians today. So a couple things to keep in mind as we do. Of course, our fivefold guide for interpreting Scripture that comes to play in every passage that we'll be talking about, context in particular. So we're not interested in simply looking at Galatians 3.28 and say, well, what does that verse mean? But we want to look at the message of the book of Galatians and then understand 3.28 simply as part of that, uh, a small but very pointed part of that. Uh, and of course, watching for specific versus exclusive language, explicit versus implicit, descriptive versus prescriptive, and always letting the language of the text sort of shape the way we express our theology of gender. So, so not to bring up some other issues that we haven't found in the text yet, uh, only as they would come up later. Okay, and then we are also, just so we keep it in mind, we are also comparing the teachings of Genesis. And even though that is narrative, it is narrative about what God did in creation. So, so we're pretty sure that God, the main character in Genesis 1 through 2, uh, and a major player in chapter 3, that God is right in what God is doing in creation. So, so even though it's narrative, it's our other significant text. Now, um, <clears throat> we saw in Genesis, humanity created as male and female in God's image with unity and diversity, a different way they were created. We are different as men and women, at least biologically and physiologically. Other than that, it's hard to measure what the first man and woman were like. But there was a sense of unity, not created separately from the ground, but created from one another. She came from him, and ever after, men came from women, and we all come from God, so a sense of connectedness. Uh, the issue of headship or head 
doesn't play a role in Genesis, it doesn't yet play a role in Galatians, it doesn't play a role in Philemon, so we will return to that. Uh, it does connote point of origin when it's applied to other persons or things, uh, other things rather than uh, human beings. And men and women are called to rule, so we do have language of hierarchy, but we rule together. Uh, and patriarchy, we do have language of hierarchy connected specifically with the man, but that comes as the result of sin, along with several other things that come as the result of sin. So, okay, let's come then to the new covenant community in Galatians and Philemon, uh, the images of Paul and a Gentile, anonymous Gentile Roman citizen here, uh, a Gentile that has slaves, Philemon, uh, attending to him, and then the women of the New Testament, the average sort of folk Jewish woman in this context, or maybe folk Roman woman, but also the aristocratic women. So several characters that come to play when we think about gender in the context of Galatians. Oh, let me back up just one click here. Uh, why pick Galatians first? Remember our discussion of Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and my friend uh, Beth, uh, who said, uh, depending on which chapter you start with, you'll come up with a different view on gender roles. Um, we chose to start with Genesis 1 because God started with Genesis 1. It seemed like a logical place in the beginning. Uh, we are starting with Galatians for a similar reason, because it is the earliest of Paul's letters. Somewhere between 48 and 55. If you take an early date for Galatians, certainly the earliest of his letters. If you take a later date, then one of the earliest of his letters. The letter to 1 Corinthians uh, would be one that would match uh, right beside it. But most would feel that Galatians comes before 1 Corinthians. So we're looking at it first because it's chronologically first. And it gives us an idea of what's in Paul's mind about gender before we come to the next letters that he writes, and specifically to 1 Corinthians. Uh, and then the, secondly, it is a circulating letter. So it wasn't just written to one particular church about a few persons in that church who were a problem. Now, Paul does write letters like that, so we want to be sensitive to the persons he addresses them to. But in this context, a, a letter that goes around to the churches in the province of Galatia, modern-day Turkey, swinging around what's ancient Asia Minor. Now, let's put the map on the screen here. So Galatian province here, and then we're going to be talking, I've highlighted the cities that are most pertinent to us but we're going to be talking uh, specifically about Corinthians, uh, the city of Corinth, the city of Ephesus, both in the Ephesians letter as well as in the letter to Timothy, and then Colossae written beside Ephesians, not a major text for us, but one that serves as sort of a complement to Eph uh, the Ephesians letter, and then of course the letter to the uh, Galatians. Okay, the question then, <clears throat> first impressions from reading the text of Galatians. What is the new thing that drives this passionate letter of the apostle to the Gentiles? Paul, an old rabbi, was called, radically called, to be an apostle to Gentiles. That plays a role here, <clears throat> because this letter is all about including Gentiles. But there is something new in this new creation, in this new covenant, that wasn't there in the Old Covenant, something radically new that causes Paul to, with passion, some would argue with a certain degree of anger, to call Jewish people to live differently than what they were used to living under the Old Covenant. Something new is taking place in the new community. <clears throat> so the questions then or the answers perhaps we should say, Gentiles can for the first time get saved like Jews. This is really about Gentiles being saved like Jews are able to get saved. One possible answer, and of course the method would be by faith, uh, although probably it very quickly jumps to your mind that 
persons got saved by faith before this time. Uh, Abraham wasn't saved by keeping the Mosaic law. He lived too early, and besides that, he wasn't able to do it perfectly. Same with Moses, same with David, other persons in the Old Testament. Jews must now live together with Gentiles as one in Christ, without the old distinctions. So, so the, the, what's startling about the New Covenant isn't just that now people can get saved by faith, where before they had to get saved by works. It's not just now people can get saved where nobody before Jesus was able to get saved, but it's rather based on your oneness in Christ, based on what happens when God accepts both of us by faith, Jew and Gentile. We ought to live differently. And hopefully you can see how this touches on that critical question of status and function. Status is our oneness in Christ, salvation by faith. We, we come into Christ. But the question then about function addresses how we live after that happens. Do, do we live in a radically new way? Do we maintain old distinctions that may have related to the Mosaic Law or the Old Testament in general? So, uh, is it how we live? Is it salvation by faith? Or are both addressed? in the epistle? And if so, which is the primary emphasis? Which is Paul concerned about? And when I say Paul's concerned, uh, this is the most passionate, uh, Mark Strauss, New Testament scholar from Bethel, would say the most angry letter the Apostle Paul writes. Uh, especially when you read his little clause toward the end of the letter when he says, now if someone has sinned, those who are more spiritual should address them with a spirit of gentleness. Uh, and one student very perceptively smiled and, and said, did Paul catch that message for himself in this letter? Because there's not much gentleness that we feel in the letter. So as we read it together, as we look at some key issues in the letter, I, I want to try to capture Paul's spirit in this. So if I seem unusually more intense, uh, I'm trying to let us hear this letter the way Paul is writing it. Uh, and so we can catch that. Okay, context for this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, new creation. Paul will refer to this idea uh, in Galatians. I want us to see the scripture's larger statement about it. And also from Paul, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The ability to be one in Christ speaks of an altogether new thing that has happened with humanity. The old has gone, the new is here, and all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, in Christ, through Christ, phrases that we'll repeat over and over in Paul's letters, and gave us a ministry of reconciliation that this is critical to what Paul is uh, telling the people of Galatia, to, to be reconciled to one another. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, salvation by faith, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Feel some of the passion, uh, you'll feel it more in Galatians. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So new creation, new covenant leading to new creation, leading to a ministry of reconciliation. Thank God we are reconciled. We are also given a ministry of that. And it starts within the church, reconciliation with one another, and then spreads uh, evangelistically to where we are preaching the gospel of reconciliation. So, quick outline of Galatians. <clears throat> Tried to just pick up the content of each of the chapters so we can see them in context. Uh, first of all, he starts us off in chapter one with the full gospel of grace. Okay, that this is the breadth of the gospel, not just one aspect of it, but the full gospel through faith from an apostle to the Gentiles. In chapter two, uh, and the lights came on. Uh, functional 
examples of practice, circumcision, and table fellowship with Gentiles. Circumcision was the absolute prerequisite for men under the Old Covenant. Anybody who refused to circumcise his sons, God said to Abraham, chapter 17, Genesis, well, they should be cut off from the community, no longer be part of the people of God if they don't observe circumcision. So central to Old Covenant, central to Abrahamic Covenant, now you're going to see Paul take a very different approach. So the change has to do with practice. Same with table fellowship. Be separate from the Gentiles. Come out from among them. Uh, and yet, in this context, Paul, a good Jewish rabbi who wouldn't sit at the table with a Gentile or consider eating un unclean or impure food, now uh, rebukes the Apostle Peter uh, for not doing the same, and Paul, of course, practices it himself. And then chapter 3, which I think at the end of chapter 3, which would almost be the exact center of the book, uh, at the end of chapter 3, there we have the climactic statement. It, it's short, it's pointed, but it's powerful. If anyone is in Christ, then the distinctions of Gentile, Jew, slave, free, male and female, no longer count against them. So that, that, that's why we look at Galatians. Uh, complementarian arguments often uh, point to uh, a um, study of Galatians as if, well, S. Lewis Johnson in our article for today, as if Paul would have been shocked to find out we were reading his letter in this context. That Paul would have been surprised that, that we thought his letter had anything to do with gender issues uh, because it's primarily to Jews and Gentiles. Paul is the one who connects it with gender issues. And that's the only reason we're reading it at this point. If Paul hadn't connected, we would be moving to other material. But in this context, he makes the connection. He makes it very pointedly. So, overarching Abrahamic covenant leads us to its fulfillment in the new covenant uh, being one in Christ. And then a very important example, adoption as sons, uh, quotes around it, and heirs through the one born of a woman. Now remember in Genesis 3 that the one born of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, the first messianic image and passage in the uh, Bible. Paul picks up on that here and, and points that out to us that this is the fulfillment uh, of what God had promised at the very beginning in the context of sin. And so we can all be, and keep in mind now that he has men and women in view, we can all be sons and heirs. This doesn't mean that women become more masculine, but it means in the context of inheritance, heirs, inheritance, that women have the same inheritance rights as sons do. <clears throat> it's not the same rights as all the other children, because sons had more privilege. But in Christ, we all have the sonship inheritance rights. So, very specifically speaking to gender issue. So, functional example put in here, status and function, function here, function here. Functional example, practicing holy days, very specifically commanded in the Mosaic Law. Observe the Passover, observe Yom Kippur. Hey, you're not a good Hebrew person of Israel, Israelite, or a good Jew later on if you don't observe the holy days. And in this context, Paul is going to say, forget about the holy days. Don't worry about that. Matter of fact, they can be kind of a hindrance to you. So just leave them behind. Forget about circumcision. Forget about that separation, distinctiveness of Israel versus the Gentiles. So, <clears throat> stand firm, chapter 5, maybe one of the most powerful statements next to 328 is 5.1. Stand firm in the freedom in which Christ has set you free. And don't be enslaved again to that yoke, that yoke of slavery. Paul's going to define that for us. But very powerful statement. So once again, functional example regarding circumcision. He mentions it twice in the letter because I think 
it is so central to the Jewish faith that mentioning it once, Paul may think they didn't hear me, but I'll mention it twice so they understand what I'm saying. And he says in this context, forget it. It's worthless. It can be a hindrance, this circumcision thing. So radically new imposition by Paul, God through Paul, of a new behavior, a new relationship between Jew and Gentile in Christ. And then that becomes the example, the paradigm, when Paul says, oh, by the way, same thing applies to slave and free, same thing applies to male and female. That which I just talked about for Jew and Gentile. So, yes, is 95% of Paul's letter to the Galatians about Jew and Gentile? Yes. He paints a very sharp, clear paradigm for us. But he himself applies it to gender and also to socioeconomic status. So, obey the truth of the gospel. Um, this, is, this is tricky, uh, so I want to be careful even in how I say it. Uh, but uh, we sometimes talk about the question of gender debate and gender roles as more of a secondary issue. After all, it's not really connected with the gospel. The gospel is something very different. But that concept, and I've said it myself many times, that concept is challenged by what Paul says here. That the way Jews and Gentiles live together, that functional aspect, is connected directly with the truth of the gospel. And he has some strong things to say about that also in chapter 1. And then finally, fulfill the law of Christ. And the only thing that counts, forget circumcision, the only thing that counts is the new creation. Where we, we have been brought. The new covenant community is the new creation. Gordon Fee, in his article on Discovering Biblical Equality, talks about the new community. Uh, another way of talking about new creation, I believe, a new person in Christ. Okay, let us come then uh, to what, uh, and I didn't pick the number, Paul seemed to have, uh, what I would see as 12 statements in Galatians that tell us that the book is about more than just status. It's also about function. And I believe that is the stronger emphasis by Paul. He's assuming status, that we've always been saved by faith. Uh, understand we've been saved by faith. If you think the law saves you, then you're, you're wrong. You have a misunderstanding of what has always been true. But now I want you to go beyond that and live out that oneness in practice. So uh, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, turn to Galatians so you can see context as we're looking just at specific verses, because we want to walk our way through Paul's 12 statements. But first of all, in chapter 1, verse 1, let's start there. Uh, and I'm using the English Standard Version, um, uh, which had an entirely complementary and translation team, so no bias in the translation, uh, at least in the direction of an egalitarian reading. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, in other words, not through human beings, for the, uh, but through Jesus Christ, who was more than just a human being, and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers uh, should be inclusive. ESV at least puts a footnote in there. All the brothers and sisters, uh, all the believers who are with me, to the churches, plural, of Galatia. So a more general letter, different from all the other letters we're going to be looking at. Uh, I believe this letter, and I'm citing a work now by Sherwood Lingenfelder, a former provost here, I believe this letter lays a principled foundation to what Paul thinks about oneness in Christ. His other letters now will build off of that, and we'll look how he applies it in a variety of local situations within the church. But Galatians is critically important because it lays that foundation in the first of his epistles. So the churches at Galatia, pick up in verse 6, I am astonished, Here, here's where Paul's language just starts shooting off the chart, his, his sort of temperament here, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. You're, you're deserting God. 
and are turning to a different gospel. So he shoots off right out of the chute. He comes off talking about gospel. Uh, and it's the gospel that's at stake. Not that there is another gospel, really another gospel, but there are some who trouble you. These are the Jews who say all Jews must continue observing Jewish practices. There are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So what he's going to talk about is a definition of what the gospel looks like in practice. So not just status, but more importantly, practice. Verse 8, even if I, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And then he repeats it in case we thought, wow, I can't believe he said that. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel, contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. That's Paul's introduction to what he's about to say. That's the ground he lays in order to discuss the other. So skip down to verse 15 now in his calling from God. But when God, when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I knew from the beginning I was called to a specific ministry. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into the desert, into Arabia, and returned again to Damascus. And after three years of working this out just between me and God, then I went to Jerusalem. So, so Paul coming in with a radical new statement, and even the context of his calling picks up on that. Okay, the first statement then, uh, which speaks to status and function, is in chapter 2. Pick up with the intro there. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. Titus, a Gentile who is a believer, a Gentile who's working with Paul. And I went up because of a revelation. So God has spoken to me directly. I'm writing as an apostle. Feel the power that Paul is throwing around here. Uh, to make sure people will listen to him. I had a revelation, uh, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running in vain. Pick up in verse 3. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because in Greek here, standing for Gentile in this context, an image of Gentiles, Yet because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. So again, the freedom of the gospel, the freedom of the calling of Christ has to do now with whether or not Titus ought to be circumcised as a Gentile. And there were those Jews, the false brothers, who said he has to be. Mosaic law is still fully into effect, and we need to obey that. And if he wants to be part of the body of Christ, that needs to be part of the deal. Verse 5, to them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So in case we might miss it, Paul repeats it over and over again, that what he has to say when he's talking about both status and function, well, here with the emphasis on function, question of circumcision for, circumcision for Titus, that is about the truth of the gospel. It's not a side issue, but about the truth of the gospel. Okay, skip over then to verse 11. When Cephas, read there Peter, uh, Cephas came to Antioch, outside of Jerusalem, going north into Gentile territory, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Strong language about the Apostle Peter. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with Gentiles. And when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party, those often called Judaizers, who insisted that we ought to be obeying the Old Testament law. They didn't recognize this new creation. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, 
so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Imagine confronting the apostle Peter in this way. But when I saw that their conduct, here it goes again, was not in step with the truth of the gospel. This is, this is about the essence of what New Covenant is. I said to Cephas, before all of them, public condemnation of the Apostle Peter, uh, perhaps the sort of preeminent apostle, before all of them, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Status or function, it's not about Gentiles getting saved. It's not about salvation by faith, although that's the foundation from which it builds, but it is about living and how we live it out in our relationship to the rest of the new community in Christ. So, third point then, being crucified with Christ, justification. Pick up in uh, the beginning of the paragraph in verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are to be found sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so might I, I might live to God. One of the most powerful verses in my own growing up as a believer in my college days um, to understand the crucified life in Christ. So verse 20, the famous quotation, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And here's the function, in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So here are both parts of it. Justification in Christ, by faith and not by works, not being questioned. But the life that I now live in the flesh, I do so by faith. So even as we express faith in Christ, so we ought to live that way, in the way we treat one another, in the way we live in community, uh, in the practices we observe. Okay, number four, starting with the Spirit and faith should result in continuing with the Spirit and faith. So you start with justification, you continue with sanctification, tight connection. Paul, I don't believe, would have understood if we tried to separate those two in a theological discussion. If we were to say, okay, you're saved by faith and that's it. <clears throat> How you live, completely separate question. No, Paul would have understood it, I think, more holistically. So pick up in verse 1 of chapter 3, and here he goes again with this uh, somewhat hyperbolic language. You fools, Galatians, who, is, who has bewitched you? So, so it's not friendly talk about an issue that's secondary. And foolishness in biblical wisdom is like the person who says in their heart there is no God. The fool is more than just somebody who doesn't uh, pick things up quickly here. So you fools, Galatian, who has bewitched you, is before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Here's the operative question. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And some would say, there, there you go. This is about faith and works and about coming to salvation through faith and not by works. No, that's the assumption. That's what he's playing off of. They already know that. They agree with him on that. Did you receive it by faith or by works? And of course, they're going to say by faith. Are you such fools then, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Skip down. Let's, let's continue. Come to the center before we come to uh, 4.8. Let's come to chapter 3 and pick up a central statement. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 3, the righteous will live by faith. <clears throat> 
not just coming to life by faith, but living by faith. By the way, that's also the uh, context in which that quotation comes from Habakkuk. Well, when God is not concerned with whether Habakkuk is going to become a believer, God's concerned that he lives out his life by faith, that the righteous will live by faith. So, and then in verse 15, uh, the law and the promise leading us up to its fulfillment in Christ. Pick up in verse 23 now. We'll just come to the statements. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So is justification by faith an important issue for Paul? Yes, it's the foundation for how we live. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. I mean, we've come to faith, but that guardianship of the law now has fallen off like scaffolding when the building's finished. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So if you've been baptized into Christ, then you are part of the body of Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. That's a powerful statement. Uh, and parse it for a minute. Uh, it doesn't mean that Jews and Greeks don't still exist. Of course they do. Biologic, physiologically, genealogically, uh, of course. Culturally, racially, yes, of course. But those distinctions, that old distinction, has no place in the body of Christ. No place. So there is neither Jew nor Greek as far as accounting for anything of importance as believers. There is neither slave nor free. Your socioeconomic status means nothing in Christ. You shouldn't be appointed to the board of elders at a church or a Christian organization because you make a certain number of dollars in your income. That, that's an issue of leadership and, and wisdom and godliness and giftedness. And there is no male and female. There's a punchline that Paul puts on the gender part of this statement. Uh, in English translations, the, the ESV picks it up a little bit. The NIV misses it altogether. Uh, but in, in the original language, it's there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Pause. No male and female. I mean, the very essential aspect of humanity, the distinction in creation as male and female, is safe for last as a punchline. Even those essential issues of gender mean nothing in the body of Christ, any more than being Jewish or being a wealthy person, being a free person as it flows to a slave. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings. So the promise to Abraham and to his offsprings comes to you if you are in Christ. You are heirs according to the promise. You, you have all the same inheritance rights as women that your brothers would normally have in the Abrahamic context. The only place, by the way, that we see that in the narrative of the Old Testament is with what famous patriarch and I didn't, uh, I didn't bring that to our discussion last time on narrative. So, anybody know? He gave his daughters an equal inheritance with his sons. Uh, unheard of. No other example of that in the Old Testament. The famous sage Job at the end of his life, after all that struggle. Uh, and the daughters of Job were the most beautiful in the world. I don't think that's why he gave them the inheritance, but Job the first egalitarian, if you want to look it up at the end of Job. So if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. Skip down to chapter 4 before we resume our uh, statement here in verse 3. In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, that, that, that's when Christ came, first time, God sent forth His Son, 
born of a woman, fulfilling the promise to Eve. Uh, first sin came through Eve, the first redemption, the statement of redemption comes through Eve. Born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might re receive adoption as sons. In other words, this broad adoption in Christ. And because you are sons, he's speaking now to all the believers in Galatia, God has sent the spirit of his son, picking up on the play on words, into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave. You used to be enslaved to the elementary things of the world, but that's over. But you're a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So the, the, I think the ESV rightly translates the word son in the masculine there because it's a point that Paul is making even though he's speaking to men and women in the churches at Galatia. Uh, they have all the rights as sons used to have as heirs through God. Okay, back to our question of status and function, the relationship, verse eight. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, looking at the bigger picture, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? The weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, what's he talking about? You observe days and months and seasons and years. What's he talking about? Jewish holidays, observing the Sabbath day and all the way down to observing sabbatical years and all the seasons in between. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Paul picking up the metaphor of childbirth. I went through all that labor to give birth to you and now you're just, you're gonna die on the vine. You're, you're, you're gonna go back to the weak and elementary principles of Judaism, which are now considered in the language of Paul part of the elementary principles of the world. Now, you don't feel the sacredness, so to speak, of the law of God setting the Jews apart for a special purpose. He's saying now you're in Christ, and in Christ none of that matters. So skip down to verse 18 and pick up the last few of these. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children feel the kind of tender moment he's about to get a little stronger. Uh, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Is he saying that they're not believers? That Christ being formed in them is them coming to salvation? No, that they're his little children. Uh, he, he has been in labor with them, but he wants them to be fully formed in Christ, going beyond just salvation. I wish I could be present with you now. I wish I could change my tone, for I'm perplexed about you. That's a euphemism for I'm really ticked off about the way you've been behaving. Skip down to chapter five. In the punchline statement, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It speaks not just to status, Christ has set us free, but he has set us free for the purpose of living free, for freedom. And y'all, Paul speaking to the Southern Galatians, uh, are turning back to something that you should have left. Uh, verse two, look, I, Paul, say to you, and this is where it gets really difficult, I think, in a very negative tone. Uh, if you accept circumcision, the sign of the covenant God gave to Abraham, if you accept it, Christ will be of no advantage to you. So it's not just that, that those old things are rendered null and void, they're actually kind of a hindrance here to embracing a full relationship in Christ. And I say it again, verse three, to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the spirit, 
by faith we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, Jew nor Gentile, doesn't make any difference, counts for anything. It's worthless. Like Paul looking back at his old lifestyle and laying things behind that were to him like rubbish in Philippians. Uh, that counts for nothing. The only thing that matters, end of the line there, only faith working through love. And there you have that combination again. Is it just about faith? Paul would say, God forbid. Absolutely not. Megenetoi in Greek. Uh, but it is a faith that works through love. We're talking about a holistic picture of the gospel. Verse 7, you were running well. <laughs> I, I saw you growing in Christ. Who hindered you? from obeying the truth. This is the truth of the gospel that he has mentioned several times over. Who got in the way of you doing this? So, living out your Christian life. Skip to verse 13. You, <clears throat> for you were called to freedom, brethren, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. There it is again. Status in Christ leads to function in being formed in Christ, in practicing the truth. Through love serve one another for the whole law. Forget about Moses. That whole law was summed up in one word. And I take it he's using that sort of symbolically. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Function. Practice. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. You're not living according to the truth of the gospel. Verse 16, but I say, walk by faith, excuse me, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How you live out your life in Christ. Uh, do, do you see how many times Paul addresses this and yet still we hear interpretations of Galatian, Galatians that said it has nothing to do with function. It's all about status. Equal in status, different in function. And Paul would scratch his head. No, he'd, he'd go worse than that. He, he would say something very impassioned. Verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the lusts of the flesh. Verse 25, pick up the last one then. If we live by the Spirit, now not just, not just coming to life by the Spirit, but he's going to take us beyond it. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That's where we get the idea of the walk, the walking in the Christian life. We keep in step with the Spirit. We stay in tune to the Spirit. That's living out our salvation in the everyday walk of life. And then let me pick up just one last statement in verse 15. It's, it's not a contrast, but it picks up that important theme that we saw earlier. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but here's the punchline, a new creation. That's what, that's why I think Gordon Fee is, is, is spot on when, when he says that Galatians is primarily about what it looks like to live in a new community as a new creation in Christ, and not just individualistic, as we often think about in our sort of Western culture, uh, but in community. A new creation, in verse 16, and as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and even upon the Israel of God. And we won't debate what the Israel of God means in this context. Uh, it's clear enough that Paul is deeply concerned about literal Jewish people throughout the letter. So, 12 times over, Paul makes it clear that coming to life by faith ought to result in living a life by faith. And therefore, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Therefore, and this sort of challenges, I think, some uh, um, principles of Messianic Judaism today. I have very close friends who are Messianic Jews, but I think this is a challenge. 
when it says forget about living, eating kosher, and being circumcised, and observing holidays, forget about all that. Because in Christ, that doesn't matter anymore. Let me give you one example of when I was a student at Talbot, I had a very close friend, that, that, that was back in the 70s when Messianic Judaism as we know it today was just beginning to flourish or just beginning to express itself. Uh, but I had a close friend who was Jewish who had come to faith, who was a student at Talbot with me. Uh, and I recall once uh, that he went on a radio uh, program and uh, was talking about how as a Jewish believer he was observing holidays and you know, Jewish festivals and circumcision, this kind of thing, kosher eating. Uh, and I remember my mentor, Dr. Feinberg, uh, of Feinberg Hall of Fame, uh, Dr. Feinberg saying he has missed the point of Galatians. That in Christ, in, in the church age, dispensationally, in the church age, in Christ, that doesn't matter and shouldn't be an issue. We, we shouldn't get focused on that kind of thing, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're slaves or free, whether we're men or women, that those things are rendered null and void as to giving some aspect of privilege. Now, to be clear, I repeat it because it's easy for us sometimes to miss the statement, but to be clear, it doesn't mean that in Christ, Jewish people don't exist anymore, and Gentile people don't exist. There are persons who are Jewish because of their bloodline. It's about privilege because of your Jewishness. So by extension, and we'll talk about the issue of sexual identity a little bit later in the semester, but by extension, this is not a statement, and I have heard it argued that way once or twice, this is not a statement in Galatians, especially in chapter three, uh, where he is saying it doesn't matter if, if you are uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transsexual. It doesn't matter because gender doesn't matter anymore. No, I don't think that's what it's saying. It says gender doesn't privilege you anymore. Uh, Paul was a Jewish person who went to the Gentiles specifically. Uh, he preached in the synagogues on a regular basis, but it didn't privilege him to be Jewish. And that's the issue. It doesn't privilege you to be wealthy or a person of higher status in society. And it doesn't privilege you to be a man instead of a woman. If we, if we simply take the paradigm as Paul argues it in Galatians, I, I think the conclusion we reach about the application to men and women, or male and female more specifically, the conclusion we reach is inescapable. That, that there is no authority subordination status. There is no privilege status of Jew over Gentile, or, or, or rich over poor, or free over slave. Um, and, and so I, I see Paul in this context throwing the door wide open in a very explicit way. I mean, 12 times over, he defines what he means to be one in Christ, status and function, and his concern is function. He's explicit about that, not implicit. He is explicit that this paradigm applies to men and women. Not just an implication that, oh, well, maybe this could apply outside of Judaism or outside of the Jew Gentile discussion, but he's quite explicit slave free, male, female. And he chooses the terminology, by the way, from Genesis 1 instead of Genesis 2 in the, in the Septuagint male, female language of Genesis 1. So he picks up by way of hint there on the creation account, I believe. Um, okay. Uh, let's put this now in the context of a secondary application. Uh, so we, we've seen the Jew-Gentile application in, in a very impassioned way. Uh, now we're going to change our tone. Paul said, I wish I could change my tone. Well, now we get to. Uh, change our tone and come about now, 10 or 12 years later, to the time of Paul writing to Philemon, <clears throat> uh, a slave, uh, in this context of a rich friend of Paul's, uh, at the same time that he's writing the letters to the Ephesian church, 
and also to the Colossian church. So we're going to be coming to the Ephesian church pretty soon. So we'll come back to this. But turn, if you would, to that short New Testament book of Philemon. And don't ask me which chapter to turn to. Okay. Let's put it up here. And I'll just go ahead and put the outline up because I want you, I want you to be able to absorb the outline as we see it here. So initial greetings. I'll leave this up. Let's look at the text itself. Uh, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Ophia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church that meets in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you feel a different tone? Does it feel a little bit nicer to read Philemon instead of Galatians? You feel like Paul's been shouting at you for the last 45 minutes? Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> but uh, uh, what uh, a former colleague of mine, Wayne Flory, used to call a gentleman's letter, a gentleman's request. Now, a gentleman's request is something that's stated very politely and kindly and respectfully, but with a clear understanding that he has rank on you and could you know, exert that rank anytime he wants to. So it's a gentle request in its format, but it's a very pointed request in its essence. I think you'll see that's the kind of thing that happens here. So uh, Philemon and Onesimus. Philemon is the slave owner and Onesimus a runaway slave. His name, uh, not coincidentally, means useful and he has proved in his exile from his master, his self-inflicted exile, to be useful to Paul, and Paul believes he could also be useful again if he returned home to Philemon. So let's just pick up the way Paul frames this. It's very subtle, but it's also, I think, very powerful. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. I've heard about you, Philemon. You seem to be a decent fellow, you know, full of love and grace. He's setting him up. Uh, accordingly, verse 8, though I am bold enough in Christ, and we've seen that now in Galatians, his Paul's boldness. I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do this, that which is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. Now, it's not Paul's literal child, but his child in the faith. Paul picks up several ch children in the faith. Uh, his disciple, you might say, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, now he is indeed useful to you and to me. So, a gentle appeal, a gen gentleman's request on the basis of love for one who is very dear to the Apostle Paul. Verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me, because he was so useful, to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf. Do, do you feel the kind of subtle hint there? Would have been nice to have some help here in my imprisonment. But isn't it nice that your servant, Onesimus, came and helped me on your behalf? Now, in fact, of course, he ran away and that generally wasn't thought of as very nice. But in this context, Paul is seeing the providential hand of God sending Onesimus to serve in the place of Philemon. I'm sending ba him back to you. Uh, my very heart, at the beginning of verse uh, 12 here. Um, skip down to verse 15. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while. And again, notice Paul's euphemistic language, very gentle. That you might have him back forever. Now, how should, here's the question now, how should Philemon treat Onesimus when he comes back? 
Normally a slave owner would discipline, punish the slave for running away. A cruel or harsh slave owner could do worse. Uh, but how should he treat him? <clears throat> treat him no longer as a bond servant, one who has fully devoted his life to serve you. No, don't treat him that way. But more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, so we are to now elevate the status. But Paul doesn't address abstractly the issue of slavery here. But he does by way of implication, and he does certainly at a personal level with Philemon. So treat him not as a slave, but as a brother. Why? Because you are one in Christ. This is an application of the principle that was just cryptically stated in Galatians, that slave and free doesn't matter anymore. So treat him instead as a brother in Christ, especially to me, how much more to you? Verse 17, if you consider me a partner, so not so subtle pressure coming on here, receive him as you would receive me. So not just the brother in Christ, but, but treat him as if he were the apostle Paul himself. I mean, this, this is an unheard of reversal of roles. Because if Paul came to visit Philemon, Philemon would be the servant to Paul. He, he loves him so much a brother. as a brother. Paul has an important ministry. Philemon would certainly respect him with great honor. But treat him as if you would, as if you were receiving me. Okay, skip down to verse 22, 21, excuse me. Confident of your obedience. Notice he didn't actually command him to do something, but he kind of implied he could. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Now, what could Philemon do more than what Paul has said? Set him free. It's the only thing left. He's treating the slave as if he's the Apostle Paul himself, as a dearly beloved brother in Christ, what else is left? There's only one other thing left, and that's just grant him his freedom. So, so no, it doesn't speak abstractly to the social issue uh, of slavery. But it does speak within the body of Christ to how we treat one another. And slaves should be treated as brothers in Christ, honored above yourselves as you would honor somebody else in the church above yourself. Treat them with that kind of love and respect. So let's just put it back then to <clears throat> the main screen. Two letters that we have. Uh, one, the foundational letter that Paul writes, and the other one, an application of it. Now, now I've deliberately not gone to the applications of gender issues because that's the rest of our semester. Um, but there is this one statement about slavery. There is the long statement in Galatians about Jew and Gentile. And if we take these as paradigms, then it seems to me we have to come to an egalitarian conclusion on the evangelical gender debate. Uh, we no longer challenge the question of Jew and Gentile. We haven't done that since, what, the third century AD when the church and synagogue, maybe late second century, the church and synagogue separated. If anything, we Gentiles have become the dominant ones. Uh, the question by the third century AD was, I wonder if Jewish people can really get saved. Whereas with Peter, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether those Gentiles can really get saved. But we've moved past that a long time ago. Uh, we've moved past the issue of slavery uh, more recently. <laughs> Uh, and I don't mean to confuse the racial slavery in the history of the United States <clears throat> with the socioeconomic slavery of the time of Paul. The, the racial issue is addressed more in the Jew and Gentile, the socioeconomic status and the slave issue. But we have moved past that as a church. It took us a long time. Uh, I went to college in Arkansas in the 1960s. Just do the math on that. Um, and I came from Pennsylvania, a place where we thought Lincoln was a halfway decent person. 
Uh, and I came to a place where, where the pickup trucks had rebel flags on the back and they hadn't quite moved on from the Civil War days, or should I say the war between the states. Um, and so I can remember vividly uh, of how we struggled to get past the issue of slavery. Uh, even though in the 19th century we sort of settled it. Uh, nevertheless, in the 20th century, late 20th century, we were still chewing on it. Um, we have, in the same context of the issue of slavery today, uh, we have raised the gender question. And, and remember our history from the first day of class, they have grown up sort of side by side. The, the suffrage movements of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century grew up alongside of the issue of the question of slaves in the 19th century. <clears throat> and we seem to have moved past the one issue, but we seem to have experienced the backlash. We, we seem to be stuck a bit on the gender issue to, to where we have the major debate that shapes this class uh, between complementarians and egalitarians. Um, the old hierarchies have been put away. So in a sense, we have kept on moving. Uh, we no longer say that women are unequal in status. We at least have admitted that we are equal in Christ in status. But we have retained the old hierarchy and function. And I think Galatians in particular is a uh, powerful statement that calls us to move past that. Now, I don't pretend that Galatians is the end of the discussion. Uh, it's really just the beginning of it. Because Paul does write specific instructions to several churches about gender relations. And we will continue in those. So I'm not presenting Galatians as if it is supposed to somehow override what comes later. However, <clears throat> I am presenting Galatians as a foundation, something to have in the back of our minds as we read the letters that come later. Because certainly Paul had it in the back of his mind when he wrote the letters that come later. So, okay, let me just sum up with this then, and I'll skip right to the bottom part. <clears throat> new covenant, new community, I would understand those to be intertwined. Uh, equality of privilege as heirs in Christ as the full expression of the gospel of grace. They're not separate. They're linked. Slaves and women are included with 12 examples of Gentiles regarding both status and function. And I deliberately limited that list to 12 uh, only to the passages that mention both together. There were other passages, of course, that we looked at that also mentioned it, but either one or the other. So those with power, and this is a good point to uh, close on, those with power are called to empower those without. So the Jews in power are called to include, graciously include the Gentiles without restrictions. The slave owner, Philemon, is called to embrace the slave as a brother in Christ and to esteem him more highly than himself. So it is primarily those with power who seem to be the, uh, the focus or the object of Paul's, Paul's message. And I think we have to consider that as we consider the gender debate and as we consider the reality that men still enjoy a good bit of power in our culture uh, compared to women. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.